So hello, those of you that have joined so far. We're just going to wait a couple of minutes to allow some extra people to come in. Uh, in the meantime, I'll introduce myself. I'm James Sawyer, uh, the security subject matter expert uh, at uh, SureWeb. And with me today uh, from LogMeIn, we have uh, Raghav Kosla, who will be uh, presenting. And I'll be here to help out and talk about the SureWeb side of things when it comes to LastPass. So Raghav, if you want to say hello to the folks. Yeah, thanks, James. Hi, everyone. Again, uh, Raghav Kosla. Uh, James and I have been working um, together for several months now um, on LastPass within the SureWeb environment, and uh, we're very much looking forward to uh, presenting to you today to uh, promote the value of LastPass to your customer base. Exactly. And I'm going to say it now, and I'll probably reiterate once we see more people joining in, that if you have any questions, uh, please use the question box in the webinar, and I will uh, I will read those off and, and answer those for you, just so we can keep it all in a, an organized fashion. So while we're while we're waiting here, Raghav, do you do you have any like password statistics that you could share about how uh, how people uh, use their passwords or bad habits that they might have or the type of things that uh, we see happen due to bad password hygiene? Absolutely. Great question. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, in essence, um, we, we can use some of the uh, the data breach numbers that are typically published via Verizon as a as a talking point. I think um, I, I want to say like upwards of 80 percent um, of data breaches, um, you know, are actually password related. So if we think about some of the password breaches that have occurred um, over the last 18 months, right, there was obviously the pipeline incident um there was certainly the the jbs one uh t-mobile most recently i think was a standout one for me um 47 million uh users uh credentials potentially hitting the dark web at any one moment in time uh definitely a little unsettling i think that in of itself highlights the need that when you assume that every in every human has on average at least 30 to 50 passwords, perhaps that may well be in a spreadsheet or a text file or a, um, actually a, perhaps even an, in a little black book, as I uh, discovered with one individual last week. Um, it, it's really sort of compelling to sit and think about, you know, the vulnerabilities and the, the dollar value associated to these passwords. So I think it really raises the question of, well, how can you look to address that, not just across a business, but ob obviously as well as a consumer, right, as an end, as an end, as an end user. So there's, cl there's clearly reason and, um, you know, just cause to actually think about how to address this across a business. Uh, and, it, and I think it's also not just about just simply passwords. I mean, if you think about it day to day today, James, um, you know, most of us probably have smartphones. Most of us are probably using some form of facial recognition or touch or pattern, depending upon the type of smartphone that we have. And so we're already used to this MFA-like experience, or perhaps we are receiving a text code when looking to authenticate and to make purchases on Amazon as we're getting closer to Christmas, right? So it's just, it's really interesting because all of this literally stems from just having a password. Would you not agree? Oh, I totally agree. And I think one of one of the big things that we see with people, uh, or at least that I even saw myself before, uh, once I started using uh, LastPass was you don't realize sometimes that you're reusing passwords in, in a bunch of different sites and that just leaves you open. If somebody hacked one account, they could potentially have access to multiple accounts. And I think some of the feature sets that we're gonna cover a little bit later on will really illustrate that and teach people how to be a little bit better about it. But I think we're, we're at about 107 now, so I think we're gonna get started with the main presentation. Uh, as I said earlier on, if you guys have any questions, please use the question box in the, uh, in the webinar and uh, I will see it pop up and I'll pause uh, Raghav as we're talking and ask those questions as they come up. Uh, and of course, at the end, uh, if you haven't had any questions throughout the pr uh, presentation, we will have a period of Q&A where you can always ask those questions as well. Uh, so that being said, uh, I think we can get started. Excellent, excellent. Thanks, James. So everyone, welcome today. Um, you know, it's a joint presentation between um, SureWeb and uh, LastPass with via LogMeIn. Um, again, as an introduction, uh, my esteemed colleague here from SherWeb, James Sawyer, and myself, Raghav Kosla, 
Um, joined by two of my other uh, individuals on our, uh, our side, uh, Brian McCarthy, as well as uh, Chris Rathburn. Okay, so moving along. Um, so in essence, what are we going to discuss today? So our agenda is going to consist of, in essence, password manager benefits for the MSP, which is yourselves, as well as the end user. Uh, we also thought that it might be actually uh, beneficial to have some discovery questions to actually understand and determine need associated to said uh, end customers. That would then lead into a discussion about why LastPass. I mean, those of you that walked in um, you know, a couple of minutes ago, uh, James and I, we were having a discussion about passwords and touched upon 2FA and MFA as aspects. But uh, that really kind of like generates the reason of why pass, uh, sorry, why last pass. Uh, we will have a little bit of a product overview. I'll be driving um, a couple of specific use cases that uh, James and I have found very, very valuable uh, in the discussions that we've had uh, thus far. And then lastly, uh, a call to action, right? Like what's next for you? Okay, moving along. So, right. and one thing think also, about, sorry, I don't mean yes, to interrupt you, uh, uh, Raghav, I just wanted to interject as well. Just from a security standpoint, one of the reasons why I think this is a very important webinar for everybody is I think it's a great introductory point for people looking into security. What is the first thing you should think about when you're securing your environment or breaching the topic with your customers? Passwords, because everybody has them, everybody's using them, and most of them are using them very poorly. So this is a great entry point to start that full-on conversation about overall security. Thanks, James. So just to add to that, actually, um, top left corner over there in terms of benefits for uh, MSPs there, um, I think one of the things that's very interesting is when I consider a security stack, right? I mean, you know, whether we're talking about uh, endpoint management, zero, zero trust, zero knowledge, uh, there are so many different elements or components associated to a security stack. And clearly, uh, as we've established that, you know, something like LastPass or indeed LastPass is absolutely relevant within said security stack. Why? Because obviously not only does it help secure your own business, but it also ultimately helps to secure your end client business. In addition to that, when you think about the um, what LastPass is, is actually about, right, where it says about reduces help desk calls, if, if you work on an assumption, again, that the average user has 30 to 50 passwords at any one time, that means that theoretically, if that user, uh, if they're just accessing their work computer, that's a password. If they have other applications that require different passwords and those potentially generate help desk calls to, you know, that common case of I've forgotten my password, can you reset it for me? You're collapsing all of those particular actual end calls um, from the end customer into your organization, you know, which, which in essence uh, provides ROI in both instances, not just to your organization as an MSP, but clearly obviously to the end client because now they're not being interrupted with respect to productivity. Uh, in terms of last pass specific benefits, again, focusing on the left hand side here, one of the things that LastPass introduces is this multi-tenancy view. So when you actually view the MSP portal, you'll see not only the users and the security groups, et cetera, associated to your own internal organization, but you'll also get a very, very simplistic view of all of your end clients, which when you think about it day to day, right, managing multiple uh, organizations, the question of how easy is it that to uh, not only just monitor, but also access definitely comes to mind. Um, in addition to that, and certainly uh, James could probably um, discuss this as well, uh, currently uh, we have or we support or offer a flexible and uh, consumption-based billing model. James, you want to add anything to that, perhaps? Uh, well, yeah, it's it's correct. I mean, we've uh, there's been a lot of complexity when it comes to licensing, and over the course of uh, our relationship with LastPass, we've kind of tried to streamline it and make it more simplified. So there's really two license types that will be available. One is the LastPass business with SSO included, so what we're going to call just the standard LastPass business. 
And then LastPass Business with multi-factor authentication, which gives you the ability to have uh, LastPass be your overall MFA provider. So whether you have other services or anything you want to implement into it, you wanted to do uh, things like passwordless sign-on into it, that's really the license type for you. So instead of giving you a plethora of options that are confusing and might mislead you or don't give you the features you need, you have two options. The simple LastPass password manager with most of the key benefits in it, and then the one that also includes MFA that gives you, I would say, close to, to a full-on identity management platform. Completely agree, James. Completely agree. Uh, the last bullet point there about families as a benefit. For those of you that are not aware as to what that actually is, um, if you think about it, okay, and, and again, we go back to that average user with 30 to 50 passwords. If those 30 to 50 passwords may exist or a combination of business as well as personal passwords, there might be a desire across the end client or perhaps even within your own organization to effectively differentiate between the two. For example, if I'm logged into my last pass vault and I'm logging in via my log me in email address, perhaps if I'm accessing my personal account, um, you know, the desire to have visibility of that personal account, but then leverage some of the policies associated to LastPass to actually uh, to actually keep the two entities kind of separated. And th this actually brings up a very good use case of if an employee actually logs into LastPass using their corporate email address, has access to their personal content uh, associated to you know, their own passwords, and then actually leaves the organization, whether, you know, by choice or um, you know, forcibly, from this particular position, the user will have the option to take the content that they've got on the personal side of their vault with them. So if you think about it again, day to day, the objective here is to just promote and increase password behavior across all of us, right? Um, in, in terms of as business as well as personal users. So speaking of personal users, moving to the right-hand side there, you see benefits for their end users. So as we've already established, right, we're talking about securing the actual client business, right? So an employee does actually have an impact with respect to uh, the overall client productivity rate, which touches upon the second point there. You know, I mentioned earlier about those um, common uh, resets, right, that are occurring when a client might contact your organization and say, you know, I've forgotten, you know, five passwords over the course of a month. Every time a password is obviously forgotten, that impacts productivity, which obviously impacts bottom line. So when you think about that, right, actually collapsing all of that into just effectively one password, which is the access mechanism into the vault, really does actually increase productivity. And then lastly, they're about increasing user satisfaction. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, speaking personally, and I know James is obviously using LastPass as well, we can attest to the fact that now when we want to access any one of a multitude of different websites, right, we're not actually interested in what the passwords are that are associated to those websites. We quite literally just hit launch and everything is auto-filled for us. So then for us to go out and do whatever we want to do. James, you got anything else to add to that? I was actually going to uh, jump right in and say, in my own personal use, what I really like about it is the fact that you can get rid of your old uh, favorites folders, your old bookmarks, because all of these tiles are stored within the platform. So you don't need to go directly to a site. You just go right into your vault. Uh, you can create categories within your vault as well of the specific type of content that you want to see. Like in my own personal, I have one section that's email, one that's my business apps, one that's for, for social networks and things of that nature. And I never actually have to go directly to that site. I just log into the, to, to the LastPass portal, uh, the vault. I click on the tile and I'm automatically logged in. Also, from the uh, families as a benefit perspective, uh, myself, my wife, my daughter, we all have free LastPass accounts that I've linked to a business account. So they get some uh, advanced protection features like the password hygiene and the, uh, the security dashboard that does do uh, dark web monitoring, things of that nature. So that added value on top of what they're already pay uh, paying for from that initial license, the fact that you can have up to five family members attached to that with those added security benefits, to me, I think is a, is a, a, a big differentiator uh, between you guys and, and any competitors. I don't know anyone else that's doing anything like that. Excellent points, James, excellent points. Okay, moving along. So in terms of the actual opportunity that's available for all of us over here, 
If I focus in on the number on the right hand side there, right, in terms of 2025, which is literally just four years away, hard to believe actually in some points, but $24 billion. I think that in of itself is a very, very um, large carrot for all of us to potentially uh, focus in on. But what's interesting about that, okay, is uh, moving to the left hand side there. When you think about these business leaders, right, um, again, in terms of the risks that they're actually exposed to, again, we don't need to necessarily review the breaches that have occurred over the last 18 months, but the fact that more and more cyber insurance is being, um, you know, uh, uh, offered or required, I should say, and in that, then, you know, looking at things like MFA on top of just password management, it makes it very, very interesting with respect to the actual opportunity that we're all trying to actually um, address. When you think about as well, the second bullet point there, that kind of scares me a little bit, actually. 300 billion passwords. I mean, what the global population is, I think 7.2, 7.3 billion people. And yet when you look at that multiplier right there, it really, really is quite complex, and or not complex, but really like quite compelling with respect to when you take into account that, you know, like all of these hacking organizations that are obviously global, um, you know, we, we can see that there is a very, very focused effort on potentially accessing, for, for example, even the SolarWinds one that occurred with password one, two, three, right? So from that perspective there, the risks are huge. Um, and obviously with that many passwords potentially out in the globe, uh, you know, across the entire population there, we can see the potential opportunity that we have in front of us. Yeah, I was going to I was going to bring up that example too, password one two three. When you did it, <laughs> like I was thinking about <laughs> jumping in there. And also, again, like I said, just the reused passwords. You know, people there don't want to remember too many passwords, so they end up reusing it. So if your email, your social network, your bank account, they're all using the same password, and somebody gets that one password, you're done. They have access to everything. So a very key uh, key thing to keep in mind that, the, and one of the things that we're going to see later on too with the product is that it will teach your end users to avoid those kind of mistakes and flag those type of things to your business leaders as well. So if you see end users that are using repetitive passwords in their applications, it won't let you know what those passwords are, but it does let you know, hey, they're reusing the same password or hey, these users are using weak password structures. Great, thank you, James. Th that last bullet point over there, this uh, this this SaaS growth, I re think really speaks to, uh, frankly, what we've all had to encounter um, over the last coming up on two years now. When we consider that um, companies, um, you know, like ourselves, um, uh, for example, at Log Me In here, uh, we made the decision to all work remotely, right? That in of itself, then coupled with potentially organizations working um, in a hybrid fashion, right? Sometimes at home, sometimes in the office, sometimes elsewhere in the world, right? And then obviously those individuals that are, are actually back at the office. We've, so the corporate workplace and the environment has changed. As a result of that, the end user habits or the business habits have changed. But what's interesting about that, okay, is those risks still exist. So that begs the question, how do we actually still protect those um, environments, those users that, for example, if they happen to be at a particular airport and they need to access an application, can they do it? Can they do that in a secure manner? Uh, the answer to that question is yes, they can, leveraging certainly LastPass. But again, it, it um, brings the broader question to mind of, you know, the world has changed, but yet these still these passwords and these risks they exist. Okay, moving along. So in terms of discovery questions, this gets interesting. Bear with me for a second. Okay, right. So your first question that you could theoretically pose to your clients is quite literally, can you expand on how you're currently managing your passwords? You know, again, working on an assumption that each average user has 30 to 50, this begs the question about not only how are the passwords actually created, but potentially how are they shared? And we have a classic use case of sharing credentials from user A to user B or group A to group B that might exist anywhere in the globe, actually. In addition to that, okay, with respect to uh, phishing attempts, right? As it literally states, have you had to manage any phishing attempts or successful data breaches for this client? That's interesting because that really talks back to the security uh, dashboard and the dark web monitoring that James was just mentioning there. 
LastPass users each get uh, access through to dark web monitoring. And as a result of said dark web monitoring, in the event of a compromised situation occurring, not only is the individual user notified via LastPass, but through the actual email address that is registered to the account, they will also receive notification there as well. In addition to that, in terms of, as I just mentioned, the sharing of credentials, Back in the day, uh, and James, I'm sure you've got an anecdotal story to this too, but when I think about back in the day, uh, a spreadsheet sitting on a file server and a tech support engineer um, in one of my previous roles, um, I used to be the individual that would copy paste um, a, you know, a, a particular password out of a particular cell in a spreadsheet and copy it over to a particular individual in my team. Uh, James, anything else you want to add to that? Yeah. So in a similar situation, shared OneNotes, you know, that we would use with uh, with passwords on it. And granted, it's still internally, but anybody can copy paste that data. If they leave the company, they could have a copy of it locally. Then you have to reset all of your passwords. Uh, it's just it adds to the complexity. And uh, we were talking about uh, the user satisfaction. Nobody likes changing their password. Everybody hates having to update a password list. So having a more secure environment where you're limiting the amount of time someone actually has to change their password is uh, is crucial. Thanks, James. Okay, with respect to actually changing passwords right there, think about it from your perspective. If a user contacts you, okay, how many password resets quite literally are you managing per end client? So from this viewpoint, Going back to the 30 to 50 passwords, you've collapsed all of those passwords such that the user is uh, leveraging LastPass much in the way that James described, right? You have a tile, a site that's in your vault, you access that particular object. You don't need to care or be aware of what that password is. LastPass takes care of all of that on the back end. So with respect to uh, applications now, this gets kind of interesting. This also introduces single sign-on within LastPass. Right, so today, again, if, if there are different applications that require different passwords, we're removing the need for passwords associated to those applications and more steering the customer um, or the potential client down the route towards SSO, which is effectively these work applications. With respect to uh, you know authentication, we touched upon MFA right a couple of times now, and you know honestly speaking, one aspect of uh, LastPass that James alluded to earlier is we're not just a password management solution; we truly are an identity solution. So in a certain situation, if an individual is accessing a certain application, we can actually leverage one or uh, several forms of MFA when said user is looking to access said application. Exactly. Like as an example, yeah. if you're if yeah, you're using right. another service like Duo or the Microsoft MFA, you can continue to use those applications with the LastPass. So if you have a contract and you don't want to to leave that current platform that people are using, but still want the functionality, it's integratable. But I'll be honest with you, I'm a fan of yours. You know the biometric sign in where I just put my thumbprint on it and I'm in. It's mm -hmm. great. I've I've never had a problem logging. Good to hear, James. Good to hear, and thank you for that. Lastly, there, in terms of uh, being able to track password strength and reuse, this is very interesting, not only from an end user perspective, but also from an actual admin perspective. And again, when we look at the product uh, briefly, I have a couple of use cases that I'll share with you at a high level to, to actually provide information on that. Okay, moving along. So we've talked about MFA um, loosely uh, during this discussion thus far, right? And again, when you think about discovery questions that you might be asking your clients, quite honestly, starting with where are you with MFA in general? Are you having to use MFA or implement it for cyber insurance or not? If they say to you that, yes, uh, we are interested in using it or yes, we do have to implement for cyber insurance, that brings up the questions as you can see on the left hand side. So, for example, where it says, are you using MFA? James just touched upon uh, using a thumbprint there, right? I actually use uh, LastPass MFA not just to access my vault on my home uh, uh, Mac over here, but also uh, my office-based Mac. I've removed the need for me to access uh, my Mac using a password. I simply use MFA. Uh, in addition to that, if I want to access a certain application, I have the option to leverage MFA for that too. And those are in addition. So simply having MFA access um, into my vault 
So all very, very compelling use cases. And frankly speaking as well, if a client happens to be leveraging 2FA, as when you think about um, the, that the, find that, uh, the fact that rather iPhones or smartphones in general can be spoofed, right? This now brings up, up a very, very interesting question of if a user receives a text, what kind of phone is it actually being sent to or from? From that point, right, I would rather know that I'm authenticating into something that's potentially mission critical to a business, actually using like biometric information, that, you know, information, that facial recognition, that touch, that pattern. James, anything else to add there, please? I think you got it covered. And that's like uh, the example that I gave there, too. For me, it's the thumbprint. I, I always use that. And I mean, it's unique to me. It's unique to that device. So even if someone were to clone my phone, they don't have my thumbprint they're not gonna be able to get in. Exactly. So on the off chance that the client actually says no, quite honestly, the leading question that I tend to ask um, of, of customers that I work with is, can you comment on when you think you're, you, know, you might be interested in exploring this, when, as given the fact that you understand the need for it? Just mentioned about using uh, MFA to access a workstation, right? A MacBook, a laptop, et cetera. There are more and more businesses, again, going back to users now working from home or working from anywhere for that matter, that have the desire or the business need to actually secure said workstation. You know, you don't want to be, for example, that government employee or military employee that happens to leave a laptop in the back of a car and the car window gets smashed. Because, uh, you know, over the last 18 months, according to the BBC News, those instances have actually occurred. So, again, it's a very, very compelling use case. Lastly there, who's responsible for authentication, right, in that respect? So, from that viewpoint, where is that, where, where does that, you know, responsibility actually lie? Yeah, uh, okay. one second, Raghav. We've, we do have a question in the... Uh... Right. Question from uh, one of the viewers. What makes LastPass's MFA a better choice than the MFA that is available from Microsoft 365? That's a great question. Um, um, so I, I would think about responding it, uh, to that question in this manner. From what I'm told, Microsoft Authenticator uh, initially is a very, very uh, difficult rollout. So that's one aspect of it. But in addition to that, Microsoft Authenticator, to my knowledge, can't be, access, can't be leveraged to uh, provide access through to applications that would exist in SSO as part of a, a LastPass vault. In addition to that, the use case of securing the actual laptop or you know, workstation login, so to speak, leveraging uh, Microsoft, I don't believe is possible either. Lastly, the use case of an employee actually having to establish a VPN connection, for example, that is something that can all be uh, actually accessed and provisioned using LastPass MFA. To my knowledge, Microsoft Authenticator is specifically used when accessing Azure and Azure alone. Hopefully that answers that question, James. Perfect. Well, I think so. Uh, it answered it to me anyway. Good, good, good. All right, moving along. So why is now the time to focus on password management? I mean, we've already established this, right? The, the $24 billion, the amount of uh, breaches that have occurred over the last 18 months to the two years. No, this isn't news to us, right? We already know that we're living and breathing this. But that being remote said, work. though, okay. Look why? at us right yes. here, remote work. That's Please. a big impact. Say again, James. I said uh, remote working. That's a big key factor, like us right now, working from Absolutely. home. You need to have that level of security to ensure that your data is protected wherever you are, not just in an office. People aren't in their, their castles anymore. They're spread out all over the place. And you need to have the same kind of level of control you used to have while you had everybody in one boat. Now that we're all on our own little ships all over the place, you need to still have some way to make sure that it's secure. And that's one of the things that I think is key here. Absolutely. Great point there. Love your analogy of castle there as well, because it makes me think about a moat and a drawbridge, which are all technically layers of security. One could uh, one can use that as an example. So why LastPass, right? As we've already established, we protect businesses. We're thinking about the end user convenience. When I want to access something in my vault, I simply just clear facial recognition into my phone. And now I can access or view or whatever it is that I want to do um, within my LastPass vault natively on my actual device. It goes with me wherever I happen to be. Uh, and in terms of process optimization, right? Like in essence, we're literally reducing the amount of time it takes for users to actually uh, perform tasks day to day. 
clearly that translates to um, less time taken in order to increase productivity. So that's a compelling reason from an end client perspective. All right, moving along. So password management, what does it really look like? So this is a, a, an indication of the last pass fault, right? In, in essence, as you can see here, we capture, store, generate, and fill credentials for any type of websites, right? So day to day, the things that are being accessed at a corporate level as well as at a personal level, all of them are placed centrally within LastPass. In addition to that, as we discussed earlier, right, we talked about um, protecting passwords for apps that are not covered by single sign-on, right? The question about Microsoft Authenticator actually uh, comes back to this, right? Knowing that in essence that I can use LastPass, whether it's an SSO app that is within my LastPass vault, or actually an app that is not leveraging single sign-on, right? And it's just been added into a vault. They are all still being accessed via a vault, all protected behind the vault, and all leveraging the secure passwords that theoretically are created when applicable. With respect to, you know, that's this first step of managing uh, application access, quite honestly, James summed it up very well, I feel, when he said that he no longer actually accesses websites by going to the direct sites, right, or entering in the URLs. Rather, accesses them via the uh, vault. I happen to do the same thing. And granted, this is about end user habit, but nonetheless though, right, if the initial need is to change behavior, then what we're thinking about doing is saying to an individual, now that you've changed your passwords, perhaps consider accessing everything via the vault rather than actually going through uh, the individual websites. James, you got anything to add to that? Well, I mean, that's that's it exactly. I think it's it's a better convenience factor and you get better organization. And like you said, it's just breaking bad habits and having everything in that environment. I mean, especially for me, the security dashboard uh, showing me the mistakes I was making or the weak passwords or the repetitive passwords. Also having a password generator included within your portal that includes all the complexities pa uh, possible, up to 99 characters. <laughs> you could create a password of up to 99 characters using that random generator, have it stored in there. So the only thing you need to remember is your vault password. And if you combine that with the uh, already included at least MFA to the, the LastPass vault, you're giving yourself a, a more solid security base by having only one password. You really need to remember that you can authenticate with a biometric. So you're covering the uh, uh, the rule of two, I like to call it. <laughs> to be able to access your stuff and ensure that you're keeping everything secure. No one's going to be able to access my vault unless they took my phone and cut off my phone. Well said, well said. So we've already talked about um, sharing information uh, through LastPass, right, from user A to user B, et cetera. And we'll move into that when we actually uh, review a demo uh, instance there. And then lastly, this promotion of strong password hygiene. We've already established the need behind it, and we'll uh, discuss this when we actually look at an instance of the security dashboard. I touched upon single sign-on a couple of times here already, right? And I think one of the key takeaways that I'd like for you to consider is this. What we tend to see from a client perspective um, is this, quite literally. Clients are at different points in their journey with respect to identity and access management in general. So when you work on an assumption that initially these clients might start with just password management related needs, once they've actually um, gotten familiar with leveraging LastPass right day to day, and we've become sticky in the client now, the next question that comes to mind going back to the discovery questions is quite literally, which applications are you accessing frequently day to day across the business? Is there a desire to think about using SSO to have a simple, you know, click to click to launch experience? I would like to assume that, yes, that is the case. And then ultimately, once they've actually said that this is what the, the direction that they'd like to take, it goes back down to that MFA experience, knowing that I can have a, a, an instance where perhaps if I'm uh, last week, I would have to be in Dallas at a trade show. Uh, so if I'm accessing, um, you know, uh, Salesforce, while I happen to be in Dallas last week, having MFA leveraging a geofence with a time zone and a time range. Um, associated to a policy that's provisioned to Salesforce and applied to me on the back end of an SSO app that happens to be physically um, hosted, so to speak, in my vault, is all very compelling with respect to using multiple aspects of LastPass, in essence. James, anything else to add there? 
Well, I was going to say one of the one of the things to think about too is what you're in essence getting through here too, is conditional access. And people that are using Office 365 are paying a premium for an add-on to enable that kind of functionality that comes inherent directly with LastPass. So rather than getting an add-on and another add-on or a bigger package that includes that stuff, you have one service that encapsulates those kind of security needs. And when we were talking before about identity, because a lot of people don't really think about it, but a username and a password is a form of identity. So you're combining all this stuff together, you're managing it all from this one interface without any additional add-ons for this little key thing or this little key thing. It comes back to that simplicity we were talking about, where you have the two SKUs, your LastPass business, which includes your SSO, where you can set up most of this stuff. And if you want that additional layer of MFA everywhere, you go up to that one with MFA and you have a full-on identity management. As well as uh, directory synchronization, you can uh, synchronize your local Active Directory, you can synchronize an Azure Active Directory. If you're using Okta or one login, all these things uh, make compatibility, no matter what you're doing, uh, we can find a way to make it work for you. Thanks, James. So MFA, I'm going to skip through this because we've already actually touched upon some of these use cases, right, in and around when we were addressing that Microsoft Authenticator question. Um, yeah, I think we might, the, need the to, last... we might need to skip through a little bit quickly too, just from time constraints, because we want to make sure we can fit in some of the demo stuff. Absolutely. So actually, let's move to that right now. So these are the areas that we're actually going to review just as an introduction. So let me go ahead and actually share uh my google chrome right here and we'll start with what i'm sharing right now so this actually is going to um highlight the shared folder example so here as you can see uh is my vault now as i navigate down over here you'll notice on the right hand side over here that i have a shared folder in addition to that currently i have 15 items in this shared folder what's interesting about that okay is within this particular shared folder for example, I have a subdirectory of corporate hospitality with a corporate credit card. Specifically, that will come into play uh, in, in a few moments. As I navigate down, the other aspect that I want to highlight to you is perhaps there's um, an intern that's joined a particular client company and that's going to be uh, working in sales and marketing. In this particular example over here, if I select Instagram, you'll notice that I have the option to potentially change or view uh, the password over here and potentially leverage any OTP information if it's applicable to said website. But what's interesting now, okay, is now that I've set the stage with this shared folder, when I move back up to manage the shared folder, now I can ch uh, pick and choose not only who the individuals are going to be uh, in terms of recipients to access this shared folder, but also to what level. So in this example, what I've just been sharing is for user A, okay? I'm the administrator, but what I'm going to do now is specify what user B is actually going to be able to access. In this particular example, what we're looking at is user B will only have access as a read-only level. And in addition to that, any passwords associated to websites, i.e. that Instagram example, will not actually be available. In addition to that, okay, we're actually electing to remove access through to the corporate credit card for this particular user. So now when I bring up my Mozilla uh, instance over here, you'll notice first off that you can see there's only 14 items. This is because that recipient that we invited, right, we literally stated that they're not going to get access through to the corporate credit card, which is why we see the 14. In addition to that, you can see as well that it's actually only read only, which again is what we specified. Lastly, with respect to the Instagram example, okay, again, in the said department of sales and marketing, if I were to cl uh, clicking on the wrench over here, notice again that the site password and any OTP information is potentially grayed out. This is all based upon the fact that we've set it up in that particular fashion. So what's interesting about that, okay, is again, going back through this, all right, we have a shared folder, there's a need to share credentials from user A to user B, group A to group B. It leverages that active directory that we were just referring to, but we can not only create the content, place it in LastPass, but then also securely share it based upon the rules and the privileges that we actually want to implement. So that's use case number one in and around shared folders. The next aspect that we're going to just touch upon is within the security dashboard that is actually can I, can an I just assessment. add one thing real quickly about the shared folders? 
Uh, think about it from this perspective too, because he did mention like uh, a social network. So this is something that you could leverage if you have a team of people that are all working on it. You could create whatever password as a manager you want on that, and the and the team can access the site and work in it. If one of the team member leaves, you don't have to have the inconvenience of resetting a password. They've never seen the password. You just revoke their access. They no longer have access to that tile. Everybody else keeps working business as usual, and they don't have the headache of having to update their own password list for that password change. So I think it's it's brilliant fashion to share. And keep in mind that this can be shared internally with your organization or even externally. If there's another LastPass user from another company that you've hired on to do some temporary work, you can give them temporary access to something like that. So I think it's just brilliant what you guys have done there. Thank you, James, and thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for that. So I want you to introduce the security dashboard over here and touch upon a couple of interesting cases. So first off, you can see LastPass, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're providing dark web monitoring per individual user and all the email addresses in this account are actually being monitored. In the event of a breach, notification will be received on the right hand side over here. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the individual in question will also receive notification via email. But what I want to draw your attention to, okay, is this value of five over here. When I select this view passwords, what's interesting, okay, is this, this is an assessment of the user's actual vault. So in this particular example, okay, we can see that a user actually has four reused passwords here. The question now becomes, what's the, um, what's the consequence of these reused passwords, not just to the end user, but more importantly, to the client business that you're all obviously providing services to? This actually segues into one of the reporting categories associated to the admin console. In this particular category one, here for the security, yes, James. One, one second, Raghav, we do have a question. Uh, sure. Somebody's asking, what about a hidden password that populates a login screen that allows the password to be seen? A hidden password. Can we, can we table that question towards the end if that's okay? Sure. sure. Thank you. Thank so Chris, you. we'll get back to you. Great, thanks. Good question, though. So um, just on this particular aspect over here with respect to this security report, right, we were looking at some duplicate passwords. You'll notice this particular category over here, right, three duplicate passwords for sites. When I select this now, please observe, OK, that this particular user here has been identified as not meeting the company standards. So what's interesting about this, OK, is as admins, you have the ability to start with something from a user perspective where the user is seeing that they've got duplicate passwords and they may or may not care about the business impact of these duplicate passwords. But from an admin perspective, you as admins have the ability to actually go into your client environments and actually determine which users perhaps have duplicate passwords for more than um, X amount of sites and or potentially weak passwords. And as we've already established, those are very, very common things to consider or encounter. So this is how LastPass actually addresses it. This actually introduces very nicely some aspects of the reporting capabilities. If I start with the default mechanism of user reporting, in this particular example, if I happen to search upon myself here, this gives you the ability to say that, okay, if a client comes to you and asks for an audit trail for a specific end employee, right, and they're, they're interested in maybe disciplinary actions or something like that, you have the ability to filter in on the actual user and with a customizable time frame as well. In addition to that, given that we're all working in, uh, from home or in different environments, you also have the ability to filter in on a website. So for me, the use case here again is quite literally an employee is working from home. Maybe they're working in the Pacific time zone. They want to watch um, you know, their favorite game, um, favorite American football game that's starting up. It happens to start at 8, 8, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. They're watching it at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So now they would access, you know, um, that, that game um, and the NFL via a, a site entry in their vault. But an admin could actually, rather than typing in LinkedIn up here, could actually type in the NFL and actually see, ah, which users have actually accessed the NFL in that particular example. Granted, I'm using uh, what might be, you know, like an unusual example, but it still illustrates the point. The last thing as far as the, uh, the demo aspect is concerned is in and around the policies that LastPass supports. So when I navigate over here to the left-hand side, I want to draw your attention to these different categories at the top of the screen over here. 
we, we'll start with multi-factor. We've had some discussion around MFA over the course of this session, and quite literally, when I open up this particular category over here, this highlights that we support different forms of MFA options, obviously including Microsoft Authenticator, given a question was asked about it earlier. But what's interesting about this, okay, is the fact that all of these particular MFA offerings are all talking about a user leveraging this to access the vault. What I like about LastPass in this respect, okay, is if after enabling this policy, I have the option to get very granular with who I actually want to apply this to. So I'll, I'll put you into a what if scenario. Your first client that you happen to onboard happens to be 50 employees. Of those 50 employees, okay, 25 of them are actually leveraging Microsoft Authenticator. So ordinarily, you would say inclusive list of users, you would specify edit details, and now you would pick and choose either individual users and add them, or perhaps a, a group of those 25 users. Now, the remaining 25 users might actually be encouraged to use LastPass Authenticator because they have a need to actually use some of the advanced MFA offerings that we were discussing earlier. In a similar fashion, after enabling the policy, you have the option to again get very granular. So now what we're going to do in, across that 50 employee company is we'll have a mix of them initially using Microsoft Authenticator and the remaining uh, group of employees now leveraging LastPass Authenticator. Key takeaway is here, granularity. You have the option to standardize across a company, i.e. your end client, or you can mix and match. And this approach is applicable to all of the policies associated to LastPass. James, you have anything to add to the multi-factor section, perhaps? Um, well, not really to the multi-factor section. Everything I think you said is exactly what I would have uh, mentioned, but I do like the access controls, because like I was talking about before, when we have talk about conditional access policies and the need for add-ons from Microsoft to enable that, all this stuff you can do here, you can restrict by IP address, by country, uh, by uh, uh, reverse DNS. I mean, just scroll down the page and see how many options that you have in here, all easily turned on and off with toggle switches with an edit details where you can be more precise where you need to be and a super clean, easy to understand interface. I, I, I can't say it enough, it's just brilliant the way you guys have put it together. Thank you, James. Thank you. The last area that I want to just touch upon, actually, is one specific policy that I've had to think about uh, just recently, actually. This length of site passwords right here. It's a rhetorical question to the audience today, but think about the last time that you actually had to um, add a specific site into hopefully LastPass or had to create a password uh, most recently. When you think about the fact that maybe that password had to be a certain length between X and Y, how did you currently create that password? And you know, was it based upon a policy that might be implemented to actually you know, say that this password has to actually be 32 characters in length? So in this example over here, you can see that Apple is highlighted at 32. So what we're specifying over here is a policy that says that employees of this particular client, when accessing apple.com, have to actually create a password that is at least 32 characters in length. So what I think is really meaningful about this again is the more complex the passwords, the easier it is to actually A, generate them, but then B, less likely to get hacked. And speaking of generating passwords, for those of you that are kind of not familiar with how to actually do that, let me give you a quick example. Navigating to the extension at the top right corner here saying generate secure password. This is now a randomly generated password that you know, LastPass has created for me that is 99 characters in length. I've said this before and I'll say it again, but I'll give anyone on this call $100 via Venmo if you can tell me the 14th character of that particular password that LastPass has just created. You get the point here basically, right? In that basically we don't need to retain that information. It gets populated per instance. And the only password that we need to actually retain is the one that's associated to my account to actually get into my vault. Okay, let's go back to the slide deck over here. Yeah, I think, I think we might one. need to wrap it up because I know I, uh -huh. I could talk about this all day, but we've only got about uh -huh. four minutes left. Uh, so I think we should circle back to Chris's question. Uh, what about a hidden okay. password that populates a login screen? If we could make sure that we answer that. And if anybody else has any last minute questions, please type them into the question bar and we will try to get through as many as we can with the time remaining. 
Okay, so what about hidden parts? That's an Look interesting up. screen, like, man. I don't know what happened, but yeah, for me, it's... <laughs> I'm not sure what's happening there. I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm not, not clear what's happening there, James, actually. Oh, there we go. All right. Uh, okay, what about hidden password that populates a login screen? That Okay, so if I've understood the, correct, the question correctly, so like right now, the hidden password, when a user actually launches that particular website, right, as we were demonstrating with the shared example there, the hidden password actually isn't populated. Classic use case actually is, let's say that um, a rogue employee or a would-be hacker tries to access a particular web, a particular site through this particular mechanism, where you would ordinarily enter in that original password or the current password to then try to change it to be a new password, LastPass does not actually populate that particular field. So if that's what you're referring to, Chris, we don't actually populate that field. It's never actually exposed. The other example, when I was asked this question, in case that doesn't answer your question, the other example is what if the browser in of itself says, do you actually want to uh, display or save or show this password? The answer to that is you disable it by policy. I've actually done that across all of my browsers that, have, that I actually happen to use on my MacBook, right? So whether it's uh, Mozilla, Safari, Chrome, Edge, I've literally disabled that and that's how we would typically contend with that. Okay, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, moving on, what's next for you? James, do you want to address this or shall I take it? Well, I, I can definitely address it because it's, it's something I was interested in and even something that I've pursued. So I think there's there's two key things to take away from here is one, if you're interested in, more, in learning more and want to see how it can work with you, discuss pricing and stuff, we have our account managers on our side that can leverage me. I can do a demo with you. We can look at the platform, do a deeper dive into a specific topic, if you like, and really cover it in, in better detail in a more one-on-one -on -one scenario. And the second thing is pursue certification. They have tons of, of material that you can go through and learn about. There's KBs, how-tos, things like that, but it's specifically the certification. You can get a, a course where you can get a, a badge showing that you've learned this specific material. I myself, I've done uh, the sharp seller and the implementation specialist. I didn't even know about the support badge, but it looks like it's relatively new. So I now have something new to pursue, but I highly recommend you guys go through it. All that information is really pertinent and can help you learn a lot more about the product, how to use it. And in so doing, you'll be able to figure out how to leverage it better, how to demo it yourself to your clients and get those wow moments. I mean, for me, the stuff that we covered, those four key factors, are the things that when I demo, I see as wow moments. That's why I really wanted to highlight it. The amount of policies you can do, the conditional access and stuff that doesn't require additional Microsoft application stuff to, to implement, the shared folder structure, the security dashboard that teaches you how to be better with your hygiene. These are all just winning components that, that add so much value to the product that to me, it's a no brainer. When you look at this compared to any of the other providers that are doing password management, this isn't just password management. This is a step towards full-on identity management, which is a pillar of security. So I really think that if you're looking to really fortify and you want to really follow the pillars of security going towards a zero trust model, this is the solution. And this should be your first step, no matter what, because 90% of the, the problems come from people losing a password or somebody accessing someone's password and then doing damage because of that. So if you can nip that in the bud right away, then the other stuff becomes a no-brainer. It'll be a lot easier to relax on certain other things if you've covered the identity 100%. Couldn't agree more, James. Couldn't agree more. So it looks like we're out of time. <laughs> so I do thank everybody for joining. Again, if you have more questions and stuff, reach out to your account managers. They'll reach out to me as well. And if I don't know the answer, well, I can always le uh, leverage Rago as well. Thank you all for your time today. And thanks a lot, James and Henry. It's my pleasure as always. Have a great day, everybody.